Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for, uh, for joining us for our plenary session uh, for our ninth annual uh, Texas Oral History Association Conference. Uh, my name is Jesse Esparza, and I am the program coordinator for TOHA. And uh, for our, our noon session, we uh, will be listening to a conversation by Dr. Elisa Wong uh, entitled The Texas Liberator, Witness to the Holocaust. Uh, Dr. Wong is the Meany Stevens Piper Foundation Professor of History, as well as the Associate Dean of the Honors College and the Director of European Studies at Texas Tech University. Her plenary, as I mentioned just a few moments ago, is titled The Texas Liberator, Witness to the Holocaust, in where she will focus on the creation of the Texas Liberator Project as a means of introducing the wider public to the experiences of U.S. soldiers who were witnesses to and actors in the liberation of Nazi concentration and death camps. This project serves as a portal to furthering Holocaust and genocide awareness and education. This lecture will introduce the project, speak to the narratives provided by Texas veterans of the Second World War, as well as Texas Tech University and Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission collaboration to support sustained and substantive Holocaust and genocide education in our schools. We ask that you hold your questions until the end of the session uh, uh, following Dr. Wong's presentation. And we also kindly remind you to mute your mics and to close your videos so that we don't have any interruptions with the presentation. Without further delay, it is my privilege and it is my honor. And we are glad to have you here, Dr. Elisa Wong. I turn it over to you, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sparza. Um, I, I want to thank you all for being here. I know that, you know, we, we keep saying this, right? We live in uncertain times and, um, and, and this is unprecedented. And the way that we have pivoted to virtual meetings and virtual discussions and virtual conferences and virtual workshops like this, I think is very important. And I think it speaks to the direction of what you all know so well, that, um, that we have to be able to provide access and opportunity even when we can't be close to one another, whether that is through digital archives, digital libraries, digital meetings like this, digital online education as most universities are facing today, but that, but that the work of educating, the work of being upstanders, the work of being present and being witnesses to what is happening today remains just as essential as when we were able to meet face to face. And so I want to thank you all for believing in that and for participating and for continuing this very, very important work. So bear with me. I am going to try to be super technological um, and, um, and uh, work between two different screens here, but hopefully you'll be able to see this. So can you all see my screen? Okay, excellent. So um, I was the uh, lead uh, project lead for a program called the Texas Liberator Project. And it is a project that was brought together uh, and uh, introduced to Texas Tech University by the former chair of the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission, a state commission that was commissioned to enhance understanding of the Holocaust, to bring Holocaust and genocide education to the schools, and to remind Texans of the importance of knowing our history, our global history, and the participation of citizens of the state of Texas in global issues, in global warfare, in global um, moments of both great celebration and great devastation. And so the Texas Holocaust Genocide Commission was put together um, in 2009 by Senate Bill 482. Pete Berkowitz was its first chair. And he came to Texas Tech because he was very excited because they had com com completed one of the first phases of their project. And one of the first phases of their project, let's see if I can move this forward, was to contract with the Institute for Oral History at Baylor University, an award-winning, um, groundbreaking institution that really works uh, on different projects and really has, I think, pushed 
the boundaries of what oral history and what an oral history archive can and should be. Um, and so the, the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission had identified 19 Texas veterans who were at the concentration camps during the first week of liberation. And one of the ideas is that, that they were going to speak not only to their Second World War experiences of what it was like to be a veteran from the state of Texas, um, many of whom had never left the state before they were shipped across on a boat across the Atlantic, landing you know, on the shores of Normandy, what it, what their their war experience was what it was to be you know a a, a farmhand from odessa and to be shipped across to, to europe and then to have been prepared for war but not to have been prepared for what they would see at the concentration and death camps um, under the nazi regime so the Institute for Oral History was commissioned to interview these gentlemen. And they did tend primarily to be gentlemen. They were 19 that were identified both by Baylor and by the THGC. And so I'm going to switch and show you the website. That Baylor, this is the Baylor uh, website right now. Can you see the Baylor website? Okay. Um, and you can see that there's the project overview. You can see the setup that they had where they went and actually interviewed these gentlemen, most of whom were in their mid to late 80s and early 90s. And so they have an online exhibit um, and they have the 19 interviewees. And so you can see, uh, you can view the interviews. You can ac actually access the transcripts of the interviews. Um, and there's a, a wealth of information on here as, you know, the, the, as an oral history archive. And so, so um, we, this, this is the beginning. This is the foundation of what we did as historians using this as the primary source for our Texas Liberator Project. Without this work having been done by Baylor, by the Institute for Oral History, our project would not be in existence. So Pete Berkowitz came and spoke with us at Texas Tech and said, I have these, these 19 oral history interviews. And you know, it's great, they're wonderful, but they're in an archive. And he talked about how when his grandson was young, he, he was trying to explain to his grandson the history of the Holocaust because they themselves had lost so many family members um, during that tragedy. And he said, you know, my grandson told me they had learned nothing about it in school. So how do I take these 19 oral histories, some of the, I mean, most of them are three to four hours long. Um, how do I take it and bring it to the younger generation? How do I, how do I take it to them? How do I speak to them about it? How do we make this accessible so that teachers will use this resource? How do we bring it to the people, basically? And so what he proposed was to actually make a digital book. And there are all sorts of purposes for digital books. They are wonderful resources. But when he brought it to Texas Tech, I was trying to think about, you know, my, like, how do we, how do we reach people like his grandson and my son, who at the time was 14 years old? Um, because the, the use of oral history, you have to inspire them to the use of oral history. Many of them may not have heard what oral history is. How do we show them and talk to them about what oral history is? How do we um, engage in them so that this becomes a portal to doing their own research, to accessing um, the, the Institute for Oral History, other uh, our oral history archives? And so I was sitting there thinking about it and my son um, was on the couch playing with his iPad, as many of our children are wont to do. And as I was watching him, we had just downloaded, because it was the uh, World Expo in Milan that year, and my husband is Italian, and we'd gone to Milan, and, and we'd, we'd gone to the World Expo, and we had downloaded an app that they had created for the Expo on Leonardo da Vinci. Um, and as I was watching him kind of walk through the app, it was historical, it used archival material, 
it used museum resources, and it told a story that you could click on these different things. There were 3D imaging. It was this immersive experience, and it made my son more curious. He started Googling things. He started asking questions. He got our art history books uh, off of our bookshelves. And so I started to talk to different entities on our campus and, and ask them, would you like to collaborate? Right. We have this grant from the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission. This is what I'm thinking. I'd like to make an app, but I, I need, I need help. Right. I'm a, a professor in the Department of History. I'm a professor in the Honors College. But what I was envisioning required the help and the resources and the expertise and the talents of multiple places. So what began as an app ended up being a museum exhibit, a website, web resources, film, um, a, a, a museum exhibit, a digital exhibit, um, 3D architectural renderings. And so we pulled together. One of the great things about working at a, a research university is that I was able to pull together people from six different schools, six different entities, the Honors College, the Department of History, and the College of Arts and Sciences, the Museum of Texas Tech, the College of Media and Communication, the School of Art, and the College of Architecture. And we, we um, used funding from each of those colleges, bolstered by the grant that we received from the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission, to uh, empower undergraduate research scholars and graduate students. So this whole thing is, this, this what you are about to see, is created and produced by students. So at the same time that we were creating something that would be distributed and easily accessible to all Texas middle and high school students, we were educating undergraduate and graduate students at the very same time as to the ways in which you use oral history, as to the history of the Holocaust and liberation, and as to the ways in which we do public and engaged scholarship as true scholarship right alongside traditional academic writing. So one of the first things we did was to decide um, where we were going to base this app. Now, it was very important to us that the students who interacted with this app understood that they were not playing the Holocaust. We never wanted this to be a simulation. We never wanted this to, to um, offend, insult, diminish, minimize the experience of survivors and people who did not come back or the experiences of our veterans. We wanted to make sure that this was an educational tool first and foremost. And so in order to do that, we saw this as an introduction, as a portal that would then inspire and encourage our students to do more research, to stand up as upstanders themselves, and to themselves become witnesses to the Holocaust by using the evidence that we have in our archives, in our institutes for oral history, in our museums, in our libraries, so that they could themselves become witnesses and become um, uh, engaged with the, with the active work of being upstanders. So one of the first things we had to do was to decide, well, where do we place this? Where do we situate this? So we went through all 19 of the oral histories. Um, all of my students, we had a team of about 12 students. All of my students were assigned. They had to watch each and every single video from the first minute to the last minute. Um, and so as you can imagine, 19 um, times three or four hours um, was extensive amount of research. They were all to take notes. And ultimately, we as a team decided that because the majority of soldiers who were at the initial liberation of Dachau and many of our liberators themselves talked about their experience and what they witnessed at Dachau, that we would situate it at Dachau. It's also, um, of course, um, one of the, the most well-known um, of the concentration camps. And so we decided we would situate it here. Um, we sent one of our uh, architects and graphic designers to Dachau um, itself. And while they were there, they accessed the archives and libraries. Um, they spoke with the experts there and they poured over blueprints, over photographs, and they created a 3D architectural rendering of the camp. And so what we had him do 
is go measure everything. This is a 3D virtual rendering that is actually to scale. Many of these buildings, because um, those of you who have been to Rachau, you know that many of these barracks no longer exist and they are actually flattened and you might see the concrete foundation, but nothing else. We researched the trees, we researched the grass, we researched um, everything that we could see and we could understand about what Dachau looked like so that our students who engage with the app would be able to imagine and envision um, what it looked like historically. And so quite an extensive amount of time uh, was dedicated to creating this 3D architectural rendering. We um, recreated the writing and the script on the roof um, of um, the buildings and we, we took seriously the work that was in front of us. We wanted to make this historically accurate. So once we had that in place, um, we, we started working on the app. Um, and so we understood that in order to really make the app a, a usable, useful, practical, productive um, educational tool, we couldn't just put on an app with no explanation whatsoever. We had to provide resources. And the best way for us to provide resources was to create a website that would be usable by educators, by students, by people who were, by family members, by community members, but they could open up um, and, and really explain what was happening in this app and why we had created it. So um, you're looking at our actual web page right now, and you can see that we have um, kind of an explanation of what's going on. We have, you know, a tab that talks about you know um, the project itself um, our project team so the number of students and who are in it um, who the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission are um, the 19 liberators plus two that we added from the Holocaust Museum um, Holocaust Museum Houston um, uh, archives and then we have um, you know an interact um, that that talks about the ways in which you um, can launch the app and actually interact and engage with the app. We created for educators and for students an app user's guide that really talks about the history, the historical context, why it is we did what we did, right? And provides the context for why, why the engagement with this app could really shift and change Holocaust education. So um, then what we did was we created a walkthrough, which I'm going to show you right now, that, that, um, that is a video reenactment of what happens when you actually interact and launch the app. So in the walkthrough, you begin. No. Wait, somebody's here? And so the students go to oh, the red. Arrow, identify yourself. And there they have Captain Johnson, 45th Infantry Division One, sir. We're here under orders from Lieutenant Commander Felix Sparks to liberate the Dachau concentration camp. Lieutenant Commander Sparks, eh? You can tell him that Brigadier General Henning Linden and the 42nd Artillery have already accepted the enemy's surrender. So this yes, sir. Understood, sir. Is really only to help guide the students. Because what we wanted to do, again, was not, we did not want to make this a game. We did not want this to be a simulation. We did not want the students to play at liberation. What we wanted to do was to highlight and to feature what we do best in our oral history archives, what we do best in our museum archives, what we do best as historians, which is to take primary source documents and make them speak to one another and to provide a historical analysis, interpretation, and narrative for students aged 13 to 18 uh, and beyond. I actually use this in my college level classroom um, when I teach the Second World War to begin to understand how we as historians put evidence together. So this is really multifaceted and multilayered because not only are we educating about the Holocaust, not only are we educating about the Second World War, not only are we educating about liberation, we are also showing, showing by demonstration 
how we do work as historians, how we bring evidence together, how we um, bring bring um, different pieces to speak to one another. So um, one of the things that we did is as the students are interacting through um, the app, sorry, I'm trying to get it to the right spot, is we brought together, we chose Sorry, this is not cooperating with me. There we go. Um, we chose to not reenact um, these different moments, but to actually use the sources themselves. So here you'll see one of the moments in which we have, and I'm gonna play, play this um, for a little bit. One of the moments when the, the soldiers, the student actually clicks, moves, the green arrows direct direction, the red arrows direct stop and speak to someone. But what we do is when they ask the question, we have the historical subjects through their oral history testimony speak for themselves. Mueller, can you ask those survivors what they experienced here? So here we actually supplemented what we had from the Institute for Oral History with witness testimonies from the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. And I remember I was, I was laying down, this guy says, oh my God, what a sight. <laughs> <laughs> they start picking up the people. They pick them up one by one. Most of them were dead because they couldn't. That one. And the water, the the, the less they were alive, they put them in in, in trucks and jeeps, and they took him to hospitals or they made tents and they put them in, they gave them water, they gave them uh, packets from the Red Cross. And this was bad too because the people, when they got those packages, there was a pot of milk, there was chocolate, there was a can of meat and they were so hungry they didn't care and they ate it. So hundreds died from eating this stuff because their stomach was no use to food. And I had a guy next to me, I don't know if he was a doctor once or something, he was half dead too. He was, when he got that package, and I think he was Hungarian or Romanian, he says to me, don't eat nothing. Don't eat nothing. If you're going to eat anything, you're going to die. The only thing you do, if you have sugar, take the sugar in the mouth and suck on the sugar. That's the only thing you should do. He says, the rest of them throw away. And if you want to keep it, keep it. But don't eat anything. Don't take the milk in your mouth. Don't take the chocolate. Don't take the meat because they used to give you a can of meat spam. Don't eat it, because if you're going to eat it, you're going to die. And that's what happened. Those people, they eat the stuff. They got diarrhea, and they died. This feels more like a nightmare than reality. How will we get them to believe us? So we wanted to contrast and bring into these multiple perspectives. So we had survivor testimonials, we had testimonials from the liberators, which you will see later on in this presentation. But we also wanted to get at, what was it like to be a soldier? What was it like to, to come upon these camps? What was it like to, to be 18 years old? Because one of the things that we wanted to impress upon these students, especially our high school students and our beginning college students, many of these men who were shipped abroad to, to fight in the Second World War, they were 18, 19 years old. And the question I always ask my students is, you are 18, 19 years old. If I called you to war, if I shipped you across the sea in a boat, if you had to fight in the Battle of the Bulge, digging into the earth to try to get any warmth you could, if you were the soldier that entered into Dachau, 
if you were the one who saw these walking corpses, that's how some soldiers describe them, skin and bones, how do you get people to believe what you see? And so we went to the Dallas Holocaust Memorial, uh, Dallas Holocaust Museum, and our students, I sent um, three of my students to the Dallas Holocaust Museum, they found letters from soldiers home who tried to describe to their parents what they were seeing. And this is one of the letters. And the voices, everything that you hear on this app, all the voices, all of the images, all of the uh, little avatars, all of the artwork, all done by students of Texas Tech University. Because we will remember, and we will honor these stories, and we will insist that they be heard. Germany, April 12th, 1945. Dear Mom and Dad, this will be another short note, mainly to say that I'm okay and doing fine. We're still going ahead and cleaning up the krauts like so many flies. We operate quite a way back of the armor. In this war of pursuit, there are two fronts, the armor front and the infantry front. Sometimes they are 50 miles apart. When you read in the paper that the 9th Army has advanced 25 miles in a day, it means that the armor has cleared the main highways and points of resistance. Behind them comes the infantry at a much slower pace to mop up the whole area. It is not a dangerous job for us. It is hard work and long riding. Yesterday we supported a battalion in routing out a bunch of SS troopers, OCS candidates, and 15-year-old fanatics from a hideout in the hills. It was a three-day battle and tough going all the way. Yesterday the company fired more rounds than any time before in the ETO. That shows what it was like. Today we came a long way forward and cleared out of town, Cannon Company taking a decent number of prisoners, including a major. Near the town there was a concentration camp and a large number of men were about who had just been released. They were in pitiful condition. The ordinary slave labor was healthy enough looking, but these men were sorrowfully mistreated and neglected in their long years in the concentration camp. They were thin, emaciated, and sickly. The skin of their faces was drawn tight over their cheekbones. Their eyes were tired and defeated. Their bodies wrecked for malnutrition, overwork, and disciplinary punishment. One Czech of 20, who had been interned for five years, had survived a broken neck suffered in a beating, but his mind, poor fellow, was obviously gone. The majority were Poles, and to our Polish-American boys, they told the story of horror and brutality. I talked with the Belgian and French. He was only 26, but looked 40. His feet were badly crippled from the poor shoes he'd had to wear, and badly blistered from walking. Our medic fixed him up as best he could. My heart was the seat of mixed emotions, of ever-increasing hate for the Germans who had done all this, and pity for the men who had suffered so under them. We may have to feed Germans, but by God, we had better not until we make sure that their victims aren't hungry. It's an awful thing to see men who have starved for years. As soldiers, we take what we want to eat and use. They can't do that, so this afternoon, we went in the houses and got bread and hams and beer and even shoes for them. They are happy, extremely so, to be free and look upon us as liberators much more than the citizens of France ever did. Despite their terrible experience and the fact that they are still wearing their prisoner garb, a vertically striped brown and blue tunics and trousers with a big KL painted in red, these men are already on the move home, trying to start again. This world isn't all over for them. If we do not do more, this war is a success for my part. Love, Paul. So, I want to show you a couple more sections. We have two letters from soldiers. Um, we have numerous, and this is one of our liberators, Gerd Miller, and I'm going to show you some of our liberator accounts, uh, uh, witness accounts in just a little bit, but I wanted to show you a little bit more of um, the app and the ways in which we used different moments to help tell this story. This is literally tattooed in their skin. So this is another survivor account from the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. Um, and again, trying to get at the different perspectives, trying to get at the different moments of, of what these people witnessed and what they survived. I was very bitter after the war towards everybody. 
how they allowed me to to be to go through such misery for so long and then on top of it I didn't even know for a few months that my mother survived or my father which he didn't and I was terribly angry at everything and everybody because nobody even cared after I survived that I survived I had to be protected even after that when we were in the orphanage in Krakow we were not allowed to go out because some people felt that we should not have survived and it was not safe to go out from our house from the house that we were kept in in the garden that was the only place we were allowed to go and the war wasn't even over then it was the spring of 45 so after surviving all this and my god the thoughts the hate that I had the things that I was going to do to the Germans for doing these things to us it's awesome for a child to even think about these you know I, I'm even afraid to think about them now myself I was going to be a butcher the things that I was going to do to revenge and then actually with the help of mother to try to forget the past I realized that living a normal life and continue being to be able to, to feel and enjoy that I was not destroyed. So we wanted to, to again, offer these different perspectives and offer these different moments. And I'm gonna close um, in showing you this app with um, the one of the last statements that we have. Um, some of you might actually recognize that on a loud. This is Walter Case, who is a Holocaust survivor uh, who lived in the uniform and who spoke but they were at many schools um, and at the at many Holocaust museums um, and we included him also because many of our educators had talked about the fact that they had met Walter Case and that they had seen him and so it brought a sense of intimacy and urgency to this and so what you're going to be seeing is Walter Case um, talking about um, his experience and then you're going to be seeing Lee Berg who is the father-in-law of one of our commissioners of the THGC talking about what this meant for for Jewish people what it meant for a Jewish soldier what it meant to have to rationalize what they had survived and what they had witnessed a German guard got on a loudspeaker and he said that the Allies are coming and that the Germans are leaving, that we are free. People were emaciated. I mean, just to walk would have been an ordeal, and we did not believe it. But we really did see German guards coming, climbing down the towers, changing into civilian clothes, and running off. And after about a couple, three hours, myself, maybe 25 30 other people who could still walk we came to the gate and we were pushing on the gate and on the wiring and we broke through an open hole in the wiring and we were outside the camp and we went to a to like a warehouse that was there and in this warehouse there was so much food so much bread and canned foods and uh, marmalade and that it was incomprehensible that here you have people dying every single day just 50 feet from you it was food to save everybody's life and we saw the american flag and the lead tank stopped in front of us and the young american soldier about 18 years old jumped off the tank, looked at us, and started crying. I was told that 24,000 of us walked into Gunskirchen, and in the 20-some days that we were there prior to liberation, that only 2,000 survived. 
nobody was killed. And of the 2,000, I understand that about 1,200 died after the liberation from malnutrition. My father was one of them. My father and I slept by, side by side in this hospital for 30 days. And every day I was getting stronger, eating voraciously every single day. My father was so far gone that he couldn't even hold food. And 30 days to the day that we were liberated, on June 5, 1945, when I woke up in the morning, my father was dead in the hospital next to me, which was the worst thing that could happen to me because, as I told you before, I worshipped my father. And I didn't know what I was going to do. I was 14 and a half years old, free to speak, but I didn't know anything. I didn't know anybody. I... All of us, we will never be the same. Imagine human beings living or being treated that way. I mean, it's, it, it's hard to visualize how anybody, anybody, I mean, you, 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 you possibly think that beasts live like that. But it, 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 it's utterly impossible in your, in your mind to think that, that one human being would do that to another human being. No, my, my, my attitude, I think, uh, after that was completely changed. I, I, I think that I aged. I think that aged me. I think, I, I think that had more to, in other words, up until that time, I don't think I really was a man, but uh, until I saw that, when I saw that, I said, uh, this, this world can't go on like this. This is unbelievable. After you went. So the app finishes and um, there are other, other opportunities for uh, students and educators in the general community to interact. We have educational resources. Um, so for teachers who are using the app, there are questions that they can ask. There are projects, in including how to do oral histories, oral testimonies, how to deal with artifacts, um, letters home, a list of different museums in the state of Texas, the United States, and worldwide, um, selected bibliography, selected filmography, selected archives in libraries. And then we also have here the honor roll. So one of Pete Berkowitz's final acts was he became a, an amateur archivist historian and he wanted to find as many liberators as possible. This list has grown to now nearly 500. We are actually uh, redoing our website right now and so this will actually change. But this is, these are Texas liberators who were there within the first week of the liberation of the concentration camps who were witnesses to the Holocaust, Texas citizens. Um, and he has rescued them and put them on an honor roll. We have also created interactive maps for our students to further do research. So for instance, here is a map of Europe. You can click on, for instance, this area. You can go to Dachau. You can view the liberators. And you can see all of the information we have gathered about the liberators who we know of from the state of Texas who were there within the first week of liberation. Everything from their rank to their service description to the units they served in the branch of uh, the army, if we know whether they had a commanding officer, the name of the camp they liberated, and the dates of liberation. Um, we have now included as well um, women, nurses, um, medics who were there. We've also begun work to find voices of our Latinx and our, our um, African American soldiers so that we can honor them um, as well because they were such an important part of, um, first of all, just the Second World War, but also of the, the process of liberation. And for our students, we also created an interactive map of Texas so that if Europe felt too far away, they could, for instance, be able to go to their hometown. And I'm in Lubbock, so I'm going to choose Lubbock. But you can see what liberators were actually in your hometowns and perhaps go to your local um, uh, 
uh, historical archives, your city archives, to find information. And so you can either click on the city itself or you can come here to select a city and you can find many of the cities of Texas where we find our Texas liberators. So, so who were our liberators? This is Bob Anderson. So these are some people that were, um, the, the oral histories were collected by the Institute for Oral History at Baylor. This is Bob Anderson. He was a professor at Texas Tech University. Um, we used this portrait that was taken by Mark Umstadt. Where we could, we juxtapose a service photo so that our students can understand that these were young men. Uh, they were youth. They were, they were teenagers just like them, young adults just like them. And then we juxtapose it with a portrait of of, um, of, of their present day, um, if, if they were still alive and we could do a portrait of them. Bob Anderson unfortunately passed and we use this portrait uh, as our promo, as our poster for the Texas Liberator um, exhibit at the Museum of Texas Tech. And unfortunately he died, he passed about a month before the, uh, the exhibit opened. And his son came to us in the museum and said, I'm very sorry, but I think there's been a mistake. My father was never a prisoner of war. And we had to tell his son who was there mourning his father, your father wasn't a prisoner of war. He liberated prisoners of war. Bob Anderson had never told his son. Bob Anderson is a pioneer of dyslexia. We have letters from former students who talk about the fact that until Bob Anderson helped them, until they help, he helped them find alternative ways of learning and reading, they were lost. Bob Anderson continued to rescue people. And we used this clip because it resonates with All Quiet on the Western Front so that students could understand the experience of soldiers. In Thionville or outside Thionville, which is a very lasting, uncomfortable memory. We didn't have a lot of heavy clothing. We were getting it gradually, but we had, as a wireman, you had to go out and you work with your hands, so you had gloves. And I lost a glove, and there was no other glove, so I was without a glove. So we were parked on a road in the convoy, and I looked over there, and there was a whole pile of soldiers, dead soldiers. They just lined them up on the road, you know, they, and then they were waiting for the mortuary trucks to come and pick them up. But they were mostly German soldiers. There was one American who was from our division that night before had been killed. So I went through those looking for gloves. I found a glove. I took from a young German soldier and on his belt he had God is with us. But but my thought was, Jesus, I've been praying to God all my life. <laughs> And he was my enemy, but the same thing. It yeah. didn't make sense. It didn't make any sense, sense at all. Yeah. Sorry. So this is Ted Hartman, who was a tank driver, um, and he talks about people emerging um, in their in their striped uniforms and their striped pajamas kissing the front of his tank, impeding his way, but he, but he didn't know what to do because he'd never seen anything like this before. This man returned back to, back to Texas after, after he um, was done with his service, and he became one of the first deans of the Texas Tech Health Sciences Center School of Medicine. This is William Dippo, and the video, I'm going to show you a short clip of the video, is one of the ones that touches me the most. Because here is this senior citizen, this elderly man, this veteran, who is still talking about the fact that if there is injustice in the world, sign him up. He'd be the first one to go again if they were taken. I want you to get here. We didn't know. We didn't know. The stench of the ovens would have, it should have given it away, but it was, didn't even need that. It was obvious what was going on in that enclosed 
area, Mott Housing. It will go down as infamy as man's worst in humanity to man. And while you get here, this is Melvin Waters, who when we took this portrait, he could no longer see. And he rescued a gr group of nurses, a group of women, um, and, um, sorry, a group of women, not nurses. And he talks about how afraid they were of these American soldiers because they had been brutalized, they had been raped, they had been abused by Nazi male soldiers. This is Wilson Kennefax who served as um, the, the chaplain for, for, um, for his group, for his, his troop. And he, when he was at the camp, someone came to him, a young man came to him and asked, can you help me? Are you the religious person? Are you the, 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 the spiritual advisor? And, and, and Canifax talks about the fact that he, he was not old enough or mature enough to, to spiritually advise anyone, and yet there he was. And this young man in a striped pajama said to him, will you help me organize a worship service? And he talks about how they organized a service in one of the barracks that had, that had um, stored the uniforms or, 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 or the, the, the materials that, uh, of the camp. And then they put these same people who had been transported into the same transport vehicles in order to get there. And then they, they worshiped for the first time in years they found their God again. And then he explains that that young man was Elie Wiesel. This is Ben Love. And some of you may know him because he became a business person and philanthropist um, in Houston. And he actually uh, donated significant amount of money to MD Anderson. One of the students, one of the graduate students who worked on this project, whose name, ironically, was Ian Love. Um, and so I told him that we're like, you know, uh, soulmates um, and, and the, that Ian was working on this project. He, after we completed this project a year later, was diagnosed with stage four cancer. So he went to MD Anderson to get his treatments. And while he was there, he texted me this photograph of a statue of a man named Ben Love. And he asked me, Elisa, is this our Ben Love? And I said, yes, Ian. That's our Ben Love. He's watching over us even now. And so we created not only the exhibit, we created not only the app, we created not only the website, we created a book. And this is a book put up by Texas Tech University Press. Um, it has uh, a an, an, uh, preface by George H.W. Bush. And it features the oral testimonies that were collected by the Institute for Oral History at Baylor. Again, the uh, modern day portrait and the service photo. Chet Roan was just recently interviewed for the Dallas Holocaust uh, Museum Gala that is happening in October. And he still has such a difficult time talking, but he broke down um, as a 90 year old man talking about what he remembers. Um, this is William Danner in his, um, in his testimony. And I want to end with what we begin with, which is our teaser trailer for the app, so that you begin to understand the significance of, of the power of oral testimony. Um, and I know that I'm preaching to the choir here, but what it can do to really tell our story um, in the words of the people who lived it and the ways that historians are grateful um, to this work that oral archivists do because it allows us to do work such as the Texas Liberator Project. Do you ever wonder where truly horrible things begin? The unimaginable emerges slowly, like a hungry death.
ready for this. And that well, thank you. The Texas Liberator Project. Thank you, Dr. Wong. I mean, wow, right? What, what can we say? Uh, you have already received unending praises from several of our participants. Um, you know, it, 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 it's, I think you set the bar high because, you know, our students are 21st century learners. And I think that it's our responsibility to become 21st century teachers, right, and educators. Uh, and I think that this is a, a, a great model for the rest of us to follow. Uh, certainly, I speak for myself uh, that, that I would uh, use and, and implement. Uh, and uh, we, we have a, a few moments of, uh, uh, left in this noon plenary session. Um, and uh, we'll be waiting to see people's questions pour in here in, in a moment. The praises are still coming. The questions will come soon. Uh, I, I'll kick us off with uh, asking if you might be able to address the element of trauma, revisited trauma, and if that was something that you had considered uh, in, you know, when you sort of think about the methodology of teaching the oral histories, right, to students, uh, was, that, was that something that ever came up, uh, it, it was ever considered that might occur during these interviews, if you could speak to that for a moment. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, um, much of kind of the dealing with trauma in interviewing the liberators um, was dealt with by the oral historians at, at Baylor. And they did, if you, if you look at these interviews, these, these four, four and a half hour long videos, it is incredible work. Because you saw the oral historian had to act not only as um, interviewer, historian, archivist, but also in, in some ways as, as, as human and interpreter and, and dare I say therapist, because these, these men would, would dance around the issue. For many of these men, it was the first time that they had spoken about what they had seen. They would tell stories about the war. They would tell stories about, you know, Battle of the Bulge, and they would tell stories about armed combat and going into cities. The issue of discussing the Holocaust was one, I mean, if you can imagine coming home after seeing the devastation that they saw, and this is just in terms of warfare, not even, not even talking yet about the liberation and about the concentration camps. If you can imagine coming home and knowing that you had seen your best buddy, your brother, you know, devastation, I mean, like people dying everywhere. When you saw the kind of um, devastation that was taking out on the European cities. Um, and then you add to that, these men and women who witnessed, um, death and destruction, some of these liberators talk about seeing the bodies like cordwood, right, piled up like logs. They talk about men um, and women who weighed 40 pounds. They were the ones who had to take the bodies and bury them. They were the ones, and, and many of them suffered, you know, um, you know, post-traumatic stress. Um, many of them, you know, and, and we have stories and we have documentation that, that some of them acted out violently because they could not rationalize. They could not negotiate what they were seeing, what they were witnessing, what they were a part of. You see the oral historian doing everything that he can to help guide the, 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 the witness, the, the person being interviewed in and out of that darkness helping you know when it got too hard and, and it got to to weave to take them someplace a little bit lighter and then bring them back to the question it was masterful so in walking in in watching all of this um work right when we were going through them we had we we were very aware of of kind of the issues of teaching holocaust education um and the sensitivities to it so for instance one of the things that we decided and many of the holocaust museums have to deal with this as well is you know there there are bodies i mean literal not figurative but literal bodies um the jewish faith and we again we worked with holocaust educators we worked with high school teachers we worked with middle school teachers um, we worked with a number of different people 
um, that a uh, number of different people who um, were, were so uh, tied to understanding the student who would be engaging with this and, and the kinds of maturity levels that it would take. I am someone who believes firmly that if you teach it at the right level, there is very little that you can't talk to a child about. And the earlier we talk to a child about being an upstander, about standing up for justice, about speaking out about these things, I think the better society that we, will, we shall become. But we wanted to respect the fact that the dead bodies don't belong to us and that they belong to Jewish peoples, the prisoners of war, and we wanted to honor that. So in our app, there is not a single dead body. We choose to talk about it. We talk about the numerous bodies, the soldiers in the oral testimonies, they talk about that, but we do not show any images. The one image we have of the bodies is in that teaser trailer that I showed you. We'll have one photograph that was taken by one of our liberators. Otherwise, we choose not to do that. And we tend to talk about experience rather than um, a lot of the, the, um, the rather than show um, demonstrate that. And so we hope that this will will encourage the students, encourage the community to go to, um, and I see here um, looking at the Shoah Foundation. Yes, absolutely. Going to the Shoah Foundation, going to the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, going to our Texas Holocaust Museums, um, and beginning to grapple with that. Um, but yes, it was always at the forefront of our minds. But I think that in dealing with that idea of trauma, we also we become stronger and we become more able to negotiate those things. Uh, thank you for saying that. Um, you know, and again, right in the interest of time, if you could, Dr. Wong, kindly share your email address in the chat so that persons yeah. uh, can contact you uh, as we will not have time to get through all of the questions, but perhaps uh, you might speak briefly about the feedback you received from middle school and high school teachers who are using the application or the website. If you could speak to that for a moment. So we received very positive, um, positive feedback. Part of it is because again, we were very fortunate. Um, I saw that there was a question about funding. The, the funding came from the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission. So we received about $180,000 for this project because we're at a university and I could call on my students and we could use our own research money um, from Texas Tech as for um, undergraduate research scholars, for graduate assistantships, right? We were able to magnify that $180,000 into something that I think for a normal corporation to do to build an app like this would be upwards of $2 million. Um, we were able to, um, to, to, to do that. Um, but, um, but I think that part of the reason why the feedback has been so positive is because, again, we were very fortunate to partner with the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission. So they are doing teacher workshops everywhere all over the state on a monthly basis. They actually introduce the app and the project to the, to the teachers and um, run them through exercises, run them through questions, and contextualize how it can actually be used effectively. And so the feedback has been good, I think not just because you know, our students are incredible and have done amazing work, but because the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission has helped prepare the teachers and the teachers themselves are doing wonderful work in preparing the students to engage with this kind of topic. I think one of the things that was so effective was creating these interactive maps where the teachers could tell the students, if you're in San Antonio, click on the, the part of, of San Antonio and take a look at the names of the people who served, who are on the honor roll, who are from San Antonio or from Midland, Odessa or from Plainview, wherever you are, having that intimacy and that sense of connection where they were not just people who are far away, people who are elderly, but people from your hometown. People who are just like you, I think, creates that sense that they belong to us, that this is not a story that was, you know, decades ago and on a continent away. This is a story that belongs to all Texans as well. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and to all our participants, we see the questions still pouring in. Please do take stock of Dr. Wong's email and, and you can direct those uh, questions uh, to her. Dr. Wong, we want to thank you for an amazing and a wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, you know, 
it's sort of it's I'm, a, I'm at a loss of words when I sort of think about this kind of history, but it is a history nevertheless that must be addressed. And, and uh, it's good to know that there are uh, champions like yourself and like your team that are doing this kind of work. So thank you very much uh, and, and uh, a big applause to you and to everyone that participated in putting this together. Uh, we want to remind everyone that we start our afternoon session uh, right at 110. So please be sure to come to our Baylor University Oral History Spotlight. I want to announce very briefly that Dr. Wong's plenary presentation uh, was made possible in part with a grant from the Humanities Texas, the state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Thank you, everybody. Dr. Wong, thank you again. And please, everyone, be safe. No, thank you. And thank you to all the oral historians. This project would not have been possible without your incredible work. Thank you. Thank you.